before I uh, get on to the main topic, a number of people asked me some very intelligent questions last week after the talk. And uh, one or two really were on Mark. And what they had this to do with was the following. Uh, was everything so uh, peachy keen in Poland the way we described it uh, last week? That's always an excellent question to ask in any kind of history context because any book only gives you one side of it by definition. And indeed, there's an entire literature of uh, social criticism by rabbis and others of Jewish life in Poland. So, as is often the case, you can present the glass as being half full and you can present it as being half empty, and both are true. The uh, situation of the Jews in Poland, the, the Golden Age, uh, did exist, certainly. And the basic description that you find in the Yavim Zola is accurate. However, as you can imagine, there were the ins and the outs, the people, you know, the haves and the have-nots. Those who benefit from the system, those who not benefit from the system. And any system that's out there is liable to misuse, corruption, and all kinds of other things like that. And this is not a course I'm giving here tonight or a series of lectures on the golden age that is used in Poland. Uh, if it were, which is not what we're doing, then I would try to deal with that more fully. Uh, the very famous educational critiques of the Maral and the Kliokar and, uh, and the Zerabeirach, have you ever heard of him? And people like that who really tear into uh, the faults as they seem of Jewish society. Um, surprise, surprise. However, as I say before, even if the glass is half full, that's pretty doggone impressive. So I share that with you because someone could very easily uh, do the following. You could read two accounts of the Jewish community of Baltimore in the year 2010. And one account would read like this. This city was thriving with Judaism and Yiddishkeit. You walk down the street of Park Heights on a Saturday morning, you see dozens of synagogues and minions and parents and children uh, thronging all over the place. And there's Hashkama minions and there's uh, satyrs and all kinds of things are going on. And afterwards, there's a whole network of uh, groups and do-gooder groups and, and all of which is perfectly true. And someone would then conclude Baltimore, Maryland, the year 2010, was a total bastion of ultra-ultra-orthodoxy and the highest piety and all the rest. Another person could write a description about the Jewish community of Baltimore, Maryland, which would read as follows. Saturday morning, everybody's in, in the mall or sleeping uh, or at the uh, gym. Uh, there is zero Jewish content going on whatsoever, and everybody likes it that way. There is mass intermarriage, uh, to complete ignorance of Judaism, no one can read Hebrew, no one's even interested. And everybody goes their merry way as the community shrinks and goes into a slow euthanasia. And that would also be an accurate description of Baltimore Jewelry in the year 2010. But then someone will say, how can they both be true? I'm reading this and I'm reading that. Uh, somebody's got to be lying, unless we fall back to what we talked about last week and the week before, the dialectic. And then you'd say... Uh, this is partially true, this is partially true. There are two Jewish communities in Baltimore. And for one, it's like this Saturday morning, one of it's like that. And then you'd end up with a higher understanding of the overall picture. So in order to do Polish Jewry justice, we'd have to do it that way. But I don't have the time. And that's not the, uh, and that's not, seriously, that's not what we're here tonight. We want to focus on a subject which by itself could take 20 lectures without being, uh, you know, uh, exaggerating. So I'm going to try to crunch it into the little time that we have. And uh, I just want to uh, share with you as we go into this, uh, Professor Norman Davies has his uh, class. He writes the classic books on Poland uh, from England. He's a, he's a lover of Polish, and you know nothing changes. The king of Poland here in this golden age, King Sigmund August, is complaining to the Bishop of Krakow, tell me, my Lord Archbishop, since you do not believe in sorcery, how is it that only 16,000 Jews pay the poll taxes while 200,000 Jews apparently live underground? Notice that a lot of people are not paying their taxes. A lot of people are not reporting their income. Uh, I know such a thing doesn't happen in the United States, but I'm just trying to share with you the way things look like uh, a couple hundred years ago. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about the big uprising and turns into a major war that occurs in the year 1648 over here. Here is a map of Europe, as you can see in 1648. Here uh, I show you because it's very colorful, it's easy to see. Here's Poland, the large country over here. As you can see, Poland extends from this end to this end, 
Where I'm pointing at right now, obviously, is the extreme eastern part of Poland, what you and I today call Ukraine. The key element to understand over here is the following, that this period of Ukraine is obviously the border area, the buffer between this and this. On the left hand, where I'm pointing at this moment, is the Christian area of Poland and Europe. On this area, all the way on the right, is the, what they call the Khanate of the Crimea, Crimea and the Muslim area, the Ottoman Empire. This is the area of the Muslims. There's constant wars between A versus B and B versus A. This is the area where most of the battles happen, and the word Ukraine means a buffer zone. So uh, that's what it was. Poland long ago uh, tried to uh, I mean, conquer this and then tried to settle it in order to create a buffer zone from these guys, these Tartars, that they shouldn't be able to advance and raid all the way into Poland. As I said before, we know down till the very present day, wherever the Muslims are, you're going to have wars. You're going to have border wars. Just get used to it. And uh, that was true in that time. And every year, the uh, Muslims raided the Christians and vice versa. And uh, what that happened was the Poles had settled over long periods of time. Farmers, they tried to persuade them to, you know, uh, form settlements here and people should live there. But the idea being if there's a population, then the Muslims won't come in and settle it, a little bit like Israel has with the Shtachim and the settlements today. And uh, that's the beginning of the Ukrainians, as we call them. And uh, the only type of person that's willing to homestead in a situation like that is your tough and hardy types, because you know you're going to be raided from time to time, so you have to be made of stern stuff. And therefore, the Ukrainian people that I'm talking about, the people of the borderland, are going to have to be a hardier stock. And how are you going to deal with the constant raids? They more, to sp more or less split 50-50. I'm dumbing all this down to make it easy for you to understand. And half the, one, one, one group would be the farmers, the other group would be the showroom. <coughs> These are guys who ride around and try to protect the, uh, the farms, and if they don't, at least they can raid and punish the other side. Uh, that's the Cossacks. You understand? The showroom, so to speak, the people that emerge out of this, who uh, therefore are wild and, uh, by definition, border fighters, and uh, it's, it's uh, no quarter given, uh, dog eat dog. The Muslims come in and terrorize and burn and rape and pillage and, lo and loot and all this. And they do the same when they have a chance. And that's how life is lived. And so Vildechai is. Now, Poland wants them to serve their purpose of being a buffer force. But on the other hand, the Poles are always afraid that these guys get make, make it too big and powerful for them, britches, and one day make a country be a threat to Poland. And so the Poles, trying to be very cynical about this, they said, uh, you know, these are like your fingernails. You have to cut them every once in a while. Uh, they grow too long. That's the famous expression of the Polish king, which means that uh, the Cossacks have to be taken down a peg or two lest they get too big and powerful. And so on the one hand, you want them to be wild and build the and go fight on your behalf and raid the Tatars and the uh, Muslims. On the other hand, you want them to get too big and powerful. So it was constant fights all through the 15. In early 1600s, what exactly should be the relationship between the kingdom of Poland on the one hand and these Cossacks on the other, who are sort of subjects of Poland but aren't really? Uh, as time went on, especially in the early 1600s, the great landowners of Poland tried to stick their noses over here because it was virgin territory to take over. I won't remind you that the Ukraine is the best soil in the world, better than America. It's a tribute to the idiocy of communism that they had the best karka in the world for growing anything and they still had to import food. You see, it's, it's incredible. They, they, I remember this from when, when I was uh, in elementary school or something like that. They got the best uh, topsoil and things like this. So it's a very productive area if you know what you're doing with it. And therefore, it was tempting for the great magnates, the great uh, landowners uh, from Poland and Ruthenia, this area over here, to try to take it over, and therein lies the tale. They more or less were doing this as the 1600s went on, the late 1500s, 1600s. And what this means, basically, in simple terms, is that you have some rich and powerful Polish nobleman who sees a piece of territory, there are people inside of it, and he more or less comes and says, this is, I own this now, and I want to turn it into money, because that's the point, and uh, now I'm sending my Jew in to run it for me. Okay? And we have records and you know, documents and things like this, and uh, that's what happened. So you have a Jew or two or three that did come in in what they call an arenda, which is a lease, and basically it's like this, Shmerel or Beryl, that was their names. Or Yankel or Zachariah, you know, this is your forest. <laughs> you know, this is your area. Uh, we have documents which say for the next uh, 300 miles, everything in it, uh, the Bahamas and the peasants, that's how I used to write it, uh, all belong to you, meaning to use for me. And the idea is 
that I calculate, I, the nobleman, calculate that, you know, these lands should bring in, I'm just making this up, bring in an income of five million bucks a year. So you undertake to, for the least, to give me five million dollars up front. That's the idea. And then whatever you make over that, you know, you keep and uh, or some variation on that arrangement. And that's how business was done. Now, the type of person I'm talking about is going to say like this, how can I earn my five million and then make my profit? So you're going to tax everything you possibly can. For example, you're going to set up uh, bars and uh, uh, toll posts and uh, taxing the mills when you grind the food and uh, tax the churches. And so when's the christening and a baptism and a burial and things of this nature. And the keys of the church will be in the hand of the Jewish agent of the nobleman so that nobody can get in unless they pay the taxes beforehand. You're creating a, 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 a firestorm. You understand? If you add to that the fact, uh, if we went add more oil, <laughs> more gasoline, if you add to that the fact that the Polish nobles are Catholic and the Cossacks and the Ukrainians are Greek Orthodox, uh, then you really, uh, you can't come up with a more perfect storm, can you? Now, why would a Jew do this? You've got to make a living. But on the other hand, what kind of a Jew does this? And the answer is a tough customer, right? A tough businessman who's uh, got to be made to some degree other of stone, but who also is going to bring in, because a Jew doesn't want to live by himself, relatives and friends to make a Jewish community but the whole community is going to really be dependent, in a broader sense, on Reichman over here, or Rothschild, or whoever the rich guy is. You understand? He will have his friends and relatives uh, man the uh, estate, uh, bar, the, the taverns, or as I say, the mills, or things of this nature. He might have some of these yeshivas that he'll maintain, like we talked about last week. That's the underside of it. What's well, the economic basis of this um, golden age? Sometimes he will have other friends who will be the agents who will uh, know how to turn the local produce into an exportable product. I'll give you an example. They might have a forest. So this guy will get the peasants to chop the forest down as slave labor for the Lord. And then his cousin or friend will know how to, he, he knows somebody who knows somebody who knows how to transport this stuff to the river. And he has another guy over there who knows how to slip it all the way up the river here up to the, to the Baltic Sea. And from there, they might transport it because he knows another guy to Denmark or to England or even to Spain or Portugal or Italy to use for building ships or whatever they want it for. And that way, the nobleman, if he wishes, can uh, spend all the time in the casinos in Warsaw or Krakow or places like that. And he knows that his business is being seen to by somebody who has to pay him on January 1st five million bucks anyway. <laughs> and if the guy doesn't produce, you can get rid of him and find another Jew. Right? So this is how life was lived. But as I say, it means that uh, the Jew is in the middle of a powerful, uh, what, what should I say, complex of ethnic hatreds, religious hatreds, <laughs> political, uh, feudal, uh, in, in every regard. And uh, these guys are afraid that the Poles will one day turn them into animals, as I say before, and, and, and plow them in the fields. And the Yuvain Mitzul, which is the Jewish uh, famous account of it, he says, he has the, uh, the, the leader saying to him, he said, you better watch out what's going to happen, otherwise, it's not, it's not enough that these princes, the Polish magnates, uh, dominate us and enslave us. The, the lowest people in the world, namely the Jews, are also over us. And that means we're really the dirt of the dirt. It's bad enough to be dominated by a Polish nobleman, but to be dominated by a Jew and told when you're going to open the church by a Jew, by Christ killer, uh, is unbelievably uh, contemptuous. Hayom Osunli Zeadavar, if they do this to us today, then Lamachar Yasu Gam King Kadavar Zelachem. This will happen to everyone else. And the end of the process is they'll plow with us in the field, taking the place of the animals. You know, we're already, can't get lower than you are with a Jew giving you orders. Okay? So the point is that the Ukrainians had complaints, right? and they were valid complaints. That's what I'm trying to say. You have to understand where this came from. It wasn't simply that one day somebody get up and said, like, hey, let's go kill the Jews. They were objective economic, unfortunately, objective economic reasons that caused it, which is why Ad Hayom Hazer, the Ukrainians look at this uprising as a glorious thing, and they don't care about the fact that the Jews were hurt. They said that's collateral damage, but the bottom line is we were uh, saving ourselves from a fate worse than uh, whatever. You understand? 
So it was, it's pretty bad. The thing is that the Cossacks had tried to make some kind of stand against Poland repeatedly in the past, and each time they were crushed. So in 1635, there was a big famous thing, where, and, they, and they broke the guy on the wheel, you know what I mean? The head guy, they literally cracked him in half in Warsaw, and uh, these guys played rough. That's the point I'm trying to say. Uh, it was not the right time for a nice Jewish boy to be there, but, but they were. And uh, what it took was a leader. And uh, without a leader, you don't go anywhere. History is famous for showing us that you never get a leader from the poor and the oppressed. You actually have to have somebody from the upper classes who identifies with the poor and the oppressed and then uses his education and his elite status to put, place himself at the head of the poor and oppressed and then becomes their king. So that's what happened over here, unfortunately. Meaning the Kazakhs could complain and Borcha around for years and years and years, but it wouldn't lead to anything until they found somebody who could organize them. And this person was this guy over here, who we'll see in the movie in a minute, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, who uh, you see the years over there, who uh, is the George Washington of the Cossacks. Right? Uh, he, for us, he's the Adolf Hitler, but for them, he's the George Washington of the Cossacks. And uh, that's his uh, throne of office after he became like their sort of king. And uh, he was a charismatic fellow. He was a, a captain or a colonel even in the Cossack regiments, and he was like a shtigl, uh, uh, like a minor Polish noble. Meaning, he, had, he went to college, uh, Jesuit college. Uh, he had an education. That's the point. So he really was a member of the elite, but he was an alienated member of the elite, and therefore he knew how to express his alienation by placing himself at the head of a national movement, sort of helping to create this national movement, and then leading it. Okay? And uh, in the, the whole variety of sources out there to tell us how he personally was hurt. 